Are photons real? Does energy exist? And are we even right to try to invent physics? <laughs> yes. Maybe. And no. Kind of. Well, it depends though. So, okay, let's start with some basic contents. Like... Long before time had a name, there were four forces responsible for handling the universe. Gravity, electromagnetism, weak force, strong force, and there are actually forces that kind of a horrible name because I have a much better description of the interactions. That's because when we think of forces, we think of pushing or pulling or affecting actively like that. But these four are more like interactions. So four fundamental interactions telling matter how to behave. Now, how do these interactions happen? Well, if you think about it, it is a bit odd. Let's take gravity, for example. Like, if you have one object, it's affecting another object at a distance. So, how? I mean, is it magic? Witchcraft? Sorcery? Well, in quantum mechanics, the answer is actually pretty simple. Carrier particles. You can think of it this way. You have particle A and particle B. Now, they have some sort of interaction between them, so the way it works is by particle A interacting with the carrier particle C, and then the carrier particle C interacting with particle B. Pretty much. Kind of. Okay, there's more to it, but this video isn't about carrier particles, so let's move on. The point is that these two objects interact with each other at a distance without an actual, like, a clear medium in between them. It's not like they're in a pool of water or there is air. No, in a vacuum, they still affect each other. And that's why carry particles exist. The point of carry particles is to carry the interaction. Each interaction has its own carry particle. Weak force has bosons, strong force has gluons, gravity has gravitons, and the electromagnetic has elect photons. Photons? Yeah, photons. That's what photons are. So when two electrons interact using electromagnetism, you can think of it as two electrons interacting by using a photon. And I know that there is much more to mention with this topic, and I know that I should make a whole video about this soon. I know that I'm skipping over a bunch, but that's the basic setup. That's one of the things of which existence we will question today. Photons, light, electromagnetism, and so on. The second thing will be energy. So what is energy? Well, energy is defined as the capacity to do work. What is walk? Well, walk is the energy transferred to or from an object via the application of force. So what is energy? Well, energy is defined as the capacity to do walk. What is walk? Well, walk is the energy transferred to or from an object via the application of force. So what is energy? Well, energy is defined as the capacity to do walk. What is walk? Well, walk is the energy transferred to or from an object via the application of force. So what is energy? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, this bit is a bit of a... But the basic idea is, energy is the capacity to change stuff. The more energy you have, the more things you can change, the quicker you can change them, and the more significantly you can change them. This capacity comes in different forms, kinetic, gravitational, potential, radiant, electric, thermodynamic, whatever. These all stem from the very same equation and are just different ways of measuring the capacity to change, based on the scenario. So, given how our photons and energy seem like a, such a crucial and well-defined and proven with evidence and observed in real life thing, how could I even say that they might be not real? Well, that's a bit of a tricky topic. I mean, given how both energy and photons are, you know, widely accepted and often used in physics, so we'll have to start with something a bit more... controversial. Something like... Okay, so... What is gravity? Well, at the core, it's really simple. When you have a ball of matter A and a ball of matter B, then these two balls attract each other. Right here. That's gravity. But how would you describe it? Well, the earliest description was simple enough. Gravity is a force. So when we have a ball of matter A and a ball of matter B, they both get affected by a force of gravity. This force is proportional to their masses, and since the more mass, the stronger force of gravity you cause to happen on all the things around, and more affected you are by gravity. But there's a problem, you see. If you take a look at this force equation, the heavier something is, the more force you need to push it, which means that it just so happens that the acceleration is based only on the mass of the other object. 
That's because acceleration just happens to be equal to force divided by mass, and force of gravity divided by mass is just in relation to the mass of the other object. So the gravitational acceleration is just this. Alright, so what this basically means is that all objects affected by a big object accelerate the same way. Ha! Huh. What a coincidence! Isn't that a quirky and interesting coincidence? And definitely not a foreshadowing. It just, just all objects just happen to accelerate the same way. Anyhow, in quantum mechanical theory, it basically looks like this. You have these two balls and they interact using some kind of force. This force is a field, like this. Now, instead of using proper maths to explain them, I'll just straight up say that this will be an oversimplification, and if you'd like to learn more, I recommend Libertex textbooks and Wikipedia page link, I'll link in the description. But the basic idea is simple. Imagine a field like a volume in space, where each point has a different value. Right here, these values will be represented by brightness, and what's really important is the fact that they are quantized. So each of these values is just an integer multiple of a single quanta. So think about it this way. This volume is made up of many pixels, and each of these pixels can have a certain discrete brightness, which means that it, for example, can have a brightness of 1 or 2, but nothing in between. Now, if we go back to the field, you can see that if we can just create different fields for different forces. Strong force, weak force, gravity, electromagnetism, so on. Now, what quantum theory basically says is that if we think of all of these fields as being our interactions, and if they are made up of these quanta, then we can treat these quanta like particles. And that's where we get photons, gluons, bosons, and the gravitons. Yes, gravitons. Now, even though most of us have heard of photons and light, and even though most of us know about gravity, not everyone knows about the gravitons. That's because gravitons aren't great. I don't mean to suggest that I would be able to create a better theory than gravitons, and that gravitons suck in general, and the theory is simple or lacks complexity and wasn't difficult to create, because it is an extremely advanced theory and really impressive. All I'm saying is that gravitons don't make as much sense as other theories. That's because right here is where we enter the third definition for gravity, and that's the best one we've got. Relativity. Relativity basically says that gravity is not a force, only a curvature of space-time. So, if you have two objects, A and B, then there is nothing pulling them together. There are no particles making them come together, only that their masses curve space-time beneath them. Which means that both of these objects are still in place. Not moving. Not even a little bit. It's just that space-time is curved. That's why, as you can see in the animation, neither of these objects is moving from their own point of view, but nonetheless, they still come together. It's obviously, once again, an extreme oversimplification, but this really nicely explains the acceleration, and why it's only dependent on the mass of the other object. It's because only that object's curvature of space matters. That's a really good example of how relativity is a better theory. It's because it's not only more accurate, but also this was just a coincidence in the classical theory of gravity. Whilst when it comes to relativity, it's explained in a way which just makes it an obvious conclusion. Not a coincidence. And that's sort of what we'll be getting at in this video. We have these three theories all explaining gravity, so which one is correct? Well, none of them are. Probably. And so, right about now, it will be the perfect time to revisit the question of... When it comes to gravity, we had three answers. None of them are truly correct, because that's not the point. The point isn't to get the objectively right answer, because that's something that's mathematically impossible to do in science. Instead, the reason why we come up with these theories is that we want these theories to be useful. We don't know if any of them are right, and probably none of them are, but what we do know is that relativity describes gravity best, and the same thing goes for our photons. You see, we don't actually know if photons exist. We know that there is something that acts like a photon, but if it quacks like a duck and it floats like a duck, it could just be a duck-shaped floating quacking robot and not a duck. What do I mean by that? Well, it would be much better explained with energy, so think about it for a second. What energy basically says is that you can have hydrogen and oxygen gas together. These atoms hold in them chemical energy, and that's because there's an alternative bond for them to have, a bond lower in energy. 
When they transition from the hydrogen oxygen gas bond to water, they cause a lot of movement. You can think of it as like an elastic band going from the stretch position to a loose position. When quickly snapping like this, it creates a lot of movement, or in other words, thermal energy. This thermal energy can be used when two semiconductors, N-type and P-type, are introduced to move their charges away and generate potential difference, or in other words, electrical energy. This electrical energy can be used to power a motor, to generate kinetic, and so on. Now, what I'd like to focus on here is the question of what is energy? Well, energy is instability of chemical bonds, movement of molecules, difference in charges, movement of objects. The key thing here being the fact that these are all wildly different things! I mean, think about this. The concept of walk is just that. A concept. A thing we made up to basically represent change. Now, considering how energy is just defined in relation to that concept of walk, it's not at all surprising to learn that it's not at all consistent or a physical thing. Okay, so a better representation to a point I'm trying to make, I'd like to mention the way the concept of energy is taught in most schools, which is with a number. So this thing has 5 joules, this thing has 10 kilojoules, this has 2 nanojoules. But presenting energy this way is misleading, because it leads to a false idea that things are just like batteries, you know, storing energy, and that you can just take them and decharge or recharge, but in reality just knowing how much energy something has isn't all that useful. What actually matters is the type of energy, because who cares if you have 10 kilojoules of energy sitting in a cube if that energy is thermal and practically impossible to extract in a hot environment. That's all to say that energy as a concept is useful, but it's not like a physical thing, right? Energy can be anything that causes change and there really isn't like a fundamental particle of energy, like an energon or something. So that's why energy isn't really real. But what about photons? I mean, we did measure photons, we did detect them, and they really seem like real particles, so how could I claim they're not? Well, in order to understand that, we'll have to talk about what it actually means to measure photons. You see, photons are small. Really small. Like, like the elementary level of small, which basically means that it's the smallest thing possible. So it's quite impossible to grab a hold of one of them and probe them with instruments for a couple of reasons. So how do we measure photons? Well, the neat thing is... We don't. Yeah, we can't actually, like, measure elementary particles. What we can do, however, is measure their effects. That's the actual genius of modern science, and most of science, actually. If you're trying to discover something new, especially in physics, you have to get clever. And since you can't actually grab a hold of a photon and examine it, or actually see it, because of... It, it's, a, it's a photon, it's the f***ing light you're seeing, you have to ask yourself a question of, if photons exist, what would happen? And then one thing leads to another, and you find that if you place two slits, this is the result you get if your photons aren't real, and this is the result you get if photons are real. You perform the experiment, and there, photons are real. Or are they? Because you see, whilst you have your experiment, and it seems to be proving the existence of photons, we don't know if there is maybe something else causing it. Once again, it quacks like a duck, but just because experiments with gravity make it look like a force, it doesn't have to be a force. So we don't actually know if photons exist, only that there is something out there that acts like a photon. Except there is a problem with this kind of thinking, it's because it introduces a tad too much uncertainty. So right here we have two different ways things can seem real, but don't have to be. The photon way and the energy way. First things first, the problem with photons is that we know that there is something out there that acts like a photon, but there is no way to actually check if it exists. The issue here being that this applies to everything. And I do mean everything. If you, for example, see an apple, this doesn't actually prove the existence of an apple in front of you. All you can deduce from seeing this is that there is something out there that looks like an apple, or more specifically, produced an environment which mimicked your perception of an apple, which... It's silly. I mean, let's be real. It's a silly way to think about everything. I mean, if I have an apple in front of me, I know it's an apple. And I don't just put on my net glasses like, um, actually, I don't know if there is an apple. All we know is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pedantic argument, is my point. But what about energy? Well, for energy, it's different, because we can't really see energy. We can't really smell energy. We can't really hear energy. Energy is a concept. So, are concepts fake? 
Once again, we have the same problem. Excluding energy from existence is going a tad too far. Because with the same logic, we can exclude gravity, electromagnetism, position, force, mass, times, distance, apples, make it, subscribe on Patreon, tables, cubes, balls, and so on. Everything is a concept. And whilst it may seem extreme, consider the following. Right here we have a cube. It has 8 corners, 6 faces, and 12 edges. And we all know that it's a cube, except this cube isn't really a cube. It's a bunch of elementary particles which just happen to be forming a cube. If we, for example, twist the top part, it's no longer a cube. But none of the underlying elementary particles change, they are still there, so what have we changed? We changed their shape, and shape is a concept. So the same blade which cuts energy from existence also cuts all other concepts, which means basically everything on the human scale. So both of these arguments for non-existence are pretty silly, right? Well, are they? Why am I making this video? Why should anyone care, right? In most cases, it doesn't matter. If you hear a quack, it's a duck. If you see an apple, it's an apple. And if you assume gravity to be a force, all of physics won't collapse. But it's important to remember that distinction. It's a pedantic argument, but still a valid one. And it's important to remember that from a scientific point of view, nothing is certain. It's a useful thing to keep in mind, because that's where all of our most impressive discoveries start. Gravitons are ridiculous if you think of gravity as a force, and relativity is ridiculous if you think that gravity is carried by particles. But that's precisely what makes theories revolutionary, the fact that they challenge our understanding. And I just want you to remember that next time you see a crazy idea floating somewhere, someone disagreeing with you, or if you just need that extra bit of motivation to invent something. We don't know if our current theories are correct. We don't know if the best way to do something is truly best. We don't know if we know anything, so be respectful to others with different opinions. Be hopeful for your own theories and be curious. Because, because there, there is still, still plenty, plenty of, of science, science to reinvent. But for now, that'll be it. Thank you everyone so much for watching and have a great day. Bye.